Hello everybody you're welcome this is Mr. Navarrete and today I'll be going over the kinetics homework number one. So let's get started. For number one it says explain collision theory. What two things are required for an effective molecular collision? One which results in a reaction. For collision theory this is what we're talking about our particles crashing into each other. Our reactants are always going to be constantly in motion crashing into each other and eventually they're going to become something new. In order for this to happen one, they need to hit hard enough. Simply crashing into each other is not going to be enough. They need to hit hard enough to break the bonds that have already formed within the molecules so that they can form something new. However, not only do they need to hit hard enough, they also need to hit in the right spot. Think about it like in baseball. You might be able to hit a really, really fast ball, but if you hit it right into the hands of the pitcher or into a baseman, then it's not gonna be a home run. If you're able to hit it at the right spot, you're able to basically launch it as far away as possible. Same thing with our molecules. They need to hit at the right orientation so that our old bonds can break and new bonds can form. For two, it says, what are the six factors that affect the rate of a reaction? Well, our first one, temperature. How much energy are we putting into our reaction? Our concentration, the number of molecules that are gonna be within our reaction. Agitation, will they just be there left on their own or will we influence how they mix? Surface area, how big of a spot do our molecules have to crash with each other? Catalyst, we can lower the required activation energy for our reaction to occur with a catalyst. And lastly, the nature of a reaction. Sometimes it doesn't matter how hard our particles hit. Our molecules, they simply won't react. For three, it asks, we'll explain why the rate of a reaction is likely to be the fastest at the beginning of a reaction. So let's think about it. At the beginning of a reaction, we're going to have our reactants all crashing into each other. And then slowly, we're going to form our product. As we form something new, well, that means there's going to be less reactants, less concentration of them. So less particles crashing into each other. So we can say... In the beginning of the reaction, there's going to be more reactants present. There's going to be a higher concentration of them, allowing the rate of the reaction to be faster in the beginning versus towards the end. For four, it says define activation energy. And simply put, activation energy is the minimum amount of energy needed for a reaction to start. Depending on our reactants, sometimes we'll have a very high activation energy, and other times we'll have a very low one. For five, it says draw and label a potential energy diagram for a an exothermic reaction. And we have to make sure to include the effect of a catalyst. So first thing I'm gonna do is draw my axes. On my x-axis, I'm gonna have time. And on my y-axis, I'm gonna have energy. So let's draw my reaction. This is gonna be an exothermic reaction because if we see the energy where we started off with our reactants, and we see the difference where we ended up with our products. This energy is going to be released out into the surroundings. At our peak, we're going to have, that's our activation energy. So the energy required for our reaction to start. Now, let's see if we had a catalyst. This would be our new energy diagram. And if you notice, our activation energy with the catalyst has lowered significantly. So that means the amount of energy we need to put in for this reaction to occur is going to be a lot less than without the catalyst. For B, it says draw an endothermic reaction and again, include the effects of a catalyst. So same thing, I'm going to draw my axes. On the x-axis, I'm going to have time. And on the y-axis, I'm going to have energy. So let's draw our potential energy diagram. This is for an endothermic reaction. How do we know that it's endothermic? Well, let's look at where our energy starts and ends. This difference means that we have to include energy for this reaction to occur. And again, that peak at the very top is going to be our activation energy. Let's look at it with a catalyst. This is going to be our new energy diagram. And again, with the catalyst, our activation energy is significantly lower. Less energy needs to be put in for this reaction to occur. For six, it says, draw a graph representation 
For 6, it says, draw a graph representing the number of molecules as a function of kinetic energy at two different temperatures. Or the ice cream graph. Explain the significance of this graph. So first, I'm going to start off by drawing my axes. On my y-axis, I'm going to have the number of molecules. And on the x-axis, I'm going to have my kinetic energy. So let's look at 1 for a low temperature. This one is going to be in blue. What does this graph tell us? Well, it tells us that, you know, some are going to have very low kinetic energy. Some are going to have very high. But our average for the molecules is going to be right in the center. That's where most of them are going to be. Now, if we increase the temperature and we look at our average, again, we see some particles are going to be really above average. Some are going to be way below, but most of them, which is what we measure, are going to be on the average. Seven asks, using what you know about kinetic energy of molecules, explain why reaction rates vary with temperature. So let's look at it if we increase temperature. So if we increase our temperature, what happens? Well, we increase the average kinetic energy. And if we increase the average kinetic energy, then we increase the number of collisions. More collisions means that our reaction is going to happen a lot faster. Same thing works for a decrease. If we decrease our temperature, then we decrease the kinetic energy and ultimately decrease the number of collisions. It asks, explain how each of the following affects the rate of a reaction. Let's focus on the concentration of reactants. So how does this affect the reaction? Well, if we have a higher concentration, that means we have more particles. If we have more particles, then that means there's going to be an increase in the likelihood of collisions and works the other way around. If we decrease our concentration, there's less particles. So that means the likelihood of collision largely decreases. What about temperature? Well, if we increase our temperature, that means we increase our kinetic energy. If we increase our kinetic energy, then our particles are able to hit harder and they're able to hit more often. Same thing works for the other way around. Decrease our temperature, decrease the energy, and they're not able to hit as hard to allow the reaction to occur. All right, what about the surface area of a reactant? Well, if we increase or decrease the surface area of a reactant, that means we're either increasing or decreasing the amount of places our particles can hit. If we increase our places to hit, we increase our likelihood of the reaction to occur. Decrease the places to hit, decrease the likelihood of our reaction to occur. What about catalysts? Well, as we saw in our potential energy diagrams, Catalysts lower the activation energy. That means less energy is going to be required from our system for the reaction to occur. And INAS, describe four observable properties of a reaction, which can be used to help determine the rate of a reaction. Well, our first one is a change in color. Think about the Statue of Liberty. It's made out of copper, and copper is brown. But if you look at it in pictures, now it's green. That's the oxidation reaction that's happening. For our next two, if we were in the classroom, we could have definitely seen these. However, we've definitely seen some videos in class showing these two. We can also observe when they form a precipitate and sometimes they'll also form a gas. Sometimes a reaction might form some crystals at the bottom or precipitate or they'll form a gas which let us know that there's a reaction going on. Lastly, a change in temperature. Sometimes our flasks will get cold or warm, and that's how we know that a reaction occurred. Lastly, for 10, it asks, when white phosphorus is exposed to air that reacts rapidly with oxygen and will ignite, what can you say about the magnitude of the activation energy for this reaction? Well, let's think about it. It says it reacts rapidly when exposed to the air mainly the oxygen that's present. So if it reacts really fast without having to add a catalyst, without having to agitate it, 
without having to do much to our reaction, well, we can say that it's going to have a very low activation energy. And that's it. If you have any questions, don't forget to message myself or Mr. Morgan on Schoology. Other than that, stay safe, and I'll catch y'all next time.